David, can you hear me? All right, well, he must be having technical difficulties. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our fourth Monday program. Uh, I am gonna turn it over to um, Dr. Dorothy King. David, if you do join us, just speak up and you can speak. Dorothy, do you wanna kick us off since David seems to be having issues? I do, I will. It's all yours. Oh, okay. Oops, sorry. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I wasn't quite ready there. Didn't know I was going to do this. So, okay. Welcome to our fourth Monday program. We're so excited that you're here to share this time with us. We do a program every fourth Monday for about nine months of the year. And we provide interesting topics that relate to preservation or to um, preservation of houses in general, or if you have a specific house, a historic house that you wish to um, restore uh, in a historic way, we provide those kinds of programs. And we also do programs that relate to the architectural history and social history uh, in Harrisburg. So that's what we do. And we're very excited that you're joining us this evening. I usually ask people when we do this in person, how many of you are here for the first time? Raise your hand, but I can't do that because it's all virtual. But um, I, I wish I could ask you that because we always get new people. We all, it's always exciting to get new people. So we welcome you here. I'm going to go uh, right into this evening's uh, program. Uh, first of all, I should have said initially, Happy Women's History Month. I'm so excited to be celebrating that. It's a wonderful thing. And um, Shane, are you going to be showing the programs that are upcoming? I know sometimes you do that, or do you want me to just keep talking? We'll do that at the end. Uh, you can continue talking. I will bring that up here in a second for the okay. that I have later. So like our, you, you our next more. fourth Monday, well, our next fourth Monday program actually won't be on a fourth Monday. It's going to be a program about restoring windows. And you might say, why is that a, why is that a big thing? Well, if you live in a historic home, uh, you want to be, you want to know how to restore your windows in a way that um, makes them historically accurate. And also you want to make sure that you are finding a tradesperson, uh, an artisan who knows exactly how to uh, restore windows. So um, Shane has uh, displayed that for you. Thank you. It's going to be on Saturday, April the 24th. It's going to not be virtual. It's going to be an in-person uh, program. So you will actually get to see the window being restored. It's going to be at our facility and it's going to be um, uh, done in front of you in person. So you'll actually get to see it and ask questions of, of, of our wonderful um, presenter. John Littner, he's going to be doing the presentation. You'll be able to ask him questions. Thank you to the Auchincloss Family Fund for providing uh, a grant for us to be able to do this program. It's free, just click on the tab on our website to let us know if you were interested in attending the program. And now I'm going to be calling up in just a second our presenter, Virginia Roth. And I wanna say, I have to look this way because my notes are here, so sorry. Um, ancestry, architecture, and ambition are the underlying mm -hmm. themes for which Ms. Roth has created her program. She has looked at strong women in her family, where they lived and what they did, and their influence uh, during their time here in Harrisburg, going back at least 100 years. Uh, clearly, Ms. Roth is following in their footsteps. She is a native of central Pennsylvania, having lived in um, Dauphin County, and uh, she told me that uh, Cumberland County and Perry County. So she's lived in all three counties. Uh, so she's definitely a native. She is the president of PPONS, which is a marketing and public relations firm located in a historic building. So no surprise there, a historic building on Second Street. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Ms. Roth to tell us about the wonderful women in her family. Ms. Roth. 
Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> Roger that. Dorothy, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for that really kind and thoughtful introduction. I, uh, I was reflecting as she was talking about architecture and ancestry. I, I would akin this conversation this evening a little bit country, a little bit rock and roll. It is a, it is a blended presentation. And I'm really honored to be a guest of the association, David, Dorothy, and all the leadership that make all the neat things relating to ancestry and architecture and the bones of our city stronger and richer. I will just say that this presentation this, this evening took about five years to research. And whether you're here because uh, you have a deep devotion to the architecture and reconstruction and buildings and the bones of our city or your preferences that to learn a tip about ancestry, we're thrilled that you're here, first timer or lifer. Feel free to ask questions. We'll triage those at the end of the program and see if we can't uh, fill your cup a little, a little more richer. So- um, Ginny, have you started sharing we do not see your presentation yet? Okay, that's pretty interesting because I can see it. So Shane, you need to coach me a little bit here. So can you click the share screen button at the bottom? And then you'll see an option to select your screen. If you only have one monitor, it should just say screen one. And you can click on that and then click share in the bottom right-hand corner. Easily done. All right, we see it now. If you just want to go to full screen, we'll be all set. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. So this presentation was named in honor of my great grandmother, Catherine. The journey began actually way before it got named. And I will tell you, and anyone who does a little bit of ancestry or history research knows that the story never comes at you in one piece and one fell swoop. It comes to you in tidbits and hints and assumptions and notes. And then after a while, you start to put the puzzle together. And that's the fun of the journey. I would say I'm here this evening because I'm curious and I like to ask questions. It helps me understand sort of the here and now and how we got here. So I would say the credit for this evening goes back to a luncheon I had probably, geez, David, 15 months ago, we were sitting downtown and I was asking you questions about a book I had just finished called The Blue Orchard. It was an amazing story, uh, which is told obviously in the city of Harrisburg. And I was picking David's brain about this particular piece of the story or that story. And he pushed back on me and said, so why is this of such interest? And I said, David, Actually, the last five years, I've had a lot of fun doing my own ancestry. So we got into the whole conversation and what I will share with you this evening. And he said, you know what, Jenny, you have a date 15 months from now, next March, 2021, you're gonna be our program. So that's how I got here this evening. I will credit travel for fueling my passion and my space. I think anyone in, uh, our crazy world right now needs to know where is that space that gives me that private time? We all need that because it refuels us. And for me, it was travel. I enjoyed a Harrisburg Chamber trip to Italy uh, in, in the mid uh, 
was, I think it was 2015 or 2016. And it just gave me space to think about my family and immigration and, and the wonderful country in which we live. Uh, I came back and the next, the next uh, offering, the next offering of the chamber for a trip was to Ireland. So right there and then I had to come to Jesus with myself. And I said, you know what, Jenny, if you are truly Irish, now is the time to get that homework done. You need to find out if this is true and if you have any uh, specific data points or information on what county, what city. Now is the time because next year is the trip to Ireland. So that was my motivation. And I will tell you, I feel 40 times richer than just knowing perhaps some, some lineage uh, links. But let me take a step back, let me pause and talk a little bit about my er early years. I would say a trip down memory lane. There I am in the early 60s, probably this time that year with my father and mother and my maternal grandmother, Brogan. To the right, a little older, obviously, with my dad, Robert, and my mother, Lois. And Wonderful, wonderful experience growing up. There's some three-year-old photos. As you can see, I still had those wonderful chubby cheeks even as a, as a young person. And then the stoic, what I call it, mid-60s Christmas photo. Our mother made our wonderful dresses. I was wearing uh, glasses even in second grade. But we were a very, very happy West Shore family uh, in Cumberland County. Here we are many years later. My sister Amy and uh, Lois to the top and Carolyn uh, on our left and my brother Robert to the right. So just a sense of, I came from a family with a lot of kids, a lot of activity, a lot of conversations, and we were never short for storytelling. But before we go too far, let's just recast. I grew up in Cumberland County, but everything centered around Harrisburg whether it was Saturday trips to Pomeroy's or to see Santa or the parades downtown or to come to see the Capitol, the city was where it was at. So that's, I think, worth uh, embracing from the standpoint of just growing up. There were certainly lots of stories growing up about family, but the 60s and 70s, the era in which I grew up, there were not a ton of stories about generational experiences and what uh, my parents or grandparents and so forth had in terms of their experience. We did often tease out because my mother's maiden name was McCormick. And you can't scratch a historian in Harrisburg without sort of a quick glance at the, at the name McCormick. Yeah, we were, the, we were a McCormick family, all right. My mother was a McCormick but we were not that McCormick. Many folks know, maybe, there, maybe there's someone who's, who may not know, but the McCormick family published the newspaper and were community leaders and, and, and major, league, major leaguers, let's say, in the city of Harrisburg for years. So we were McCormick, but we weren't that McCormick. And for those who dive into details, I thought it would be worth sharing uh, a few of my resources. So of course I've used Ancestry.com, County Courthouse of the birth of some of my family members in Cambria County. You'll see some elements that were derived from conversations with the Catholic diocese here in Harrisburg, city directories. Uh, the Historic Harrisburg Association is a great resource for city directories. I knocked on the door and visited with the clerk of courts in Dauphin County. The County Historical Society and the library were, were amazing resources. Graves.com, uh, I at one point did have conversations and, and inspiration from an Irish genealogy expert. Newspapers.com, the Paradise Protectory, which I will tell you a little about shortly. And of course, the US federal census. All these things, all these resources were amazing uh, historical references throughout my journey. 
where it all began, I think a conversation about McCormick in my family has to start with my mother's father, James Lewis McCormick. And it was bizarre almost in, re in reflection because the only real story about James or Jim was that he grew up in an orphanage. And for five decades, for me, that was always the last sentence in the conversation about the McCormick side of the family. It was like, okay. And then all of a sudden I had an aha, perhaps inspired by the chamber trip opportunity. But I said, you know what, Jenny, for crying out loud, he was born. It just means the wall's a little higher. You're gonna have to dig a little deeper. You're gonna have to do a little more research. There's gotta be some sort of a story there. So I share that with a nod to, to anyone who's doing their own family research. You're gonna walk into walls. You're gonna walk into things that you just think are locked down. Be persistent, hang in there. There's, there's often a good story. It has to take a step back though, because he was born. And I was able to uncover James's parents were Samuel and Catherine, Samuel McCormick, Catherine Farron. Catherine actually was a little bit older than Samuel. They were married in Altoona in 1891, just before the turn of the century. And I do have uh, references regarding, and in fact have their uh, marriage certificate. For context, and I'm a big believer in context, it's like what, trying to imagine what was their life like at the turn of the century in Altoona. And I was able to scoop up these two newspaper articles from the Altoona Tribune, which helped me appreciate, gee whiz, Samuel had a really tough job. He was a brakeman. And in fact, on the article on the left-hand side, uh, as a brakeman with the, the uh, freight trains, he sustained uh, an injury, was in the hospital and then sent to his home. Also as a professional in communications, it's fun for me to read how newspapers printed and, and, and covered stories, how the tone of the author, so to speak. The story on the right, 1894, talks about Patients who had an amputation, someone who had a sore throat, someone who had a lacerated wound, uh, and the fact that Samuel actually lost a finger. I find the last sentence quite interesting. Uh, Joseph Bender, fracture of the skull, discharged by death, as elsewhere noted. The language that was used back over 100 years ago just made me giggle. But I thought, wow, what a tough life in the late 1890s, uh, living in Altoona, working on the railroad, which was not uncommon. The railroad was a big business in Pennsylvania at that time. So it just gave me a context. And I thought that was important as I gathered my information. So Samuel and Catherine came to Harrisburg. You're like, Jenny, that's fine, that's Altoona. Okay, they popped to Harrisburg in 1900, and that's when James is born. He was born May 16th, 1900 here in the city. You're gonna see that picture a lot because really there's only two photos that I have at all of, of James. I'm really just tickled because I actually have his baptismal certificate from St. Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, the date on that, is just a few weeks later, 1943, and it is embossed. It's, it's just amazing to have this document in my hands. When we look at Samuel and Catherine's tribe, they had five kids. And again, referencing Blanche, Edna, George came with the family when they moved from Altoona to Harrisburg. James and Richard, his younger brother, were both born here. So again, at that point, Ginny needs to level set. What was the city like at the turn of the century? What was going on here? And I pulled up a few just factoids about trying to imagine Harrisburg in 1886 when they finally paved a street or the special census in 98. 
with a, which reported 33 different ethnicities. Many of us are familiar with wonderful stories about the City Beautiful movement led by our, our city leaders and many of the women advocates pushing their husbands to, to ensure that we had a sanitary and, and healthy city, prosperous city. 1902 was the first uh, automobile here. Uh, 1906 saw the state capitol completed the construction and you'll hear from me later about the significance of our first ser service club in 1911 rotary club number 23 in all the world opened here in 1911 so that gives you a context for some of the things that were going on at the turn of the century very vibrant city growing lots of lots of uh, lots of business Here's a slide that captures the residents of the family. Five children and Samuel and Catherine for actually it's, it's uh, three and a half years between 1909 and 1912. And I will tell you, this was a, la a late data point for me after I had assembled my story. I actually, it was an afterthought for me to, to go to the city directories and actually map out where in the city, where in Harrisburg my family lived in terms of uh, running it against the timeline of the events that I had explored. And I don't know if anyone had the experience that I had, but often for me, standing in front of a physical place, a store, a building, a home, there's almost a visceral reaction for me to imagine, wow, James, he, he, was, he was a nine-year-old playing on the street right in front of this house. It just sort of blows my mind. For those of you who know the city, it's, it's a street that is, um, I would say, catty corner behind the LCB building and central to the gee whiz, am I Irish? And how important is the whole McCormick thing in my life? Well, my little family story, I have to say, is just about ready to explode. I actually remember the Sunday I was watching or listening, more likely, basketball while I was perusing newspapers.com. And I was stunned. And that's actually how many events are discovered. It's almost by accident. Samuel had been arrested by the city police. And this story is too fun not to read some of the details for you. He slept while two policemen nearly froze, while two patrolmen waited all night in the nearly zero weather at the front and rear of his home. Samuel McCormick slept peacefully between warm blankets. I'm jumping ahead. He knew that they were there, but he ignored them. It was a serious charge. When he came home that afternoon and told his wife what was going on and that he was being hunted, Catherine took the kids, ran down the street. She didn't want to be part of it. Toward morning, the patrolman who had some reinforcements, they were ready to knock down the door. So he took his time, but he came out and he was arrested. He was charged, put in jail, and held for a jury trial. I couldn't believe it. No one in my family could believe it. But it makes a lot of sense because this, there was just never a story told. There was never a hint. So I did my due diligence, and it took about six weeks and about nine phone calls to the county courthouse but the clerk of courts understood finally, the staff, that I, that I really did want to see the ledger from this court case in 1909. Could you please go get it out of the library? And after, as I mentioned, numerous phone calls, they said, Miss Roth, we have, your, we have your ledger. Come on down, take a peek. Well, at that point, I just wasn't quite sure what I was gonna see. The article also ran in the courier. 
But I will tell you, the moment where the three of us, the two clerks and myself, we looked at this large ledger, which was nearly almost historic and, and coming apart, I think we all three of us saw the letters R-A-P-E just about at the same time. And I remember the moment looking up to the two of them and they didn't know what to say. And I said, you know what? He is not a good guy. He is not a good guy. He served his term at Eastern Penitentiary in Philadelphia. And if anyone is uh, really interested in that kind of uh, experience, I will tell you they do an amazing job in terms of tours and education. I did ask for if I could take a phone photo of the ruling and they're like, no, 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 you can't, you can't do that might harm the might harm the ledger. So please let us make a photocopy of it. These two women wrestling with the ledger book, I thought they're good God they might destroy it till they get it over the copy, but I do have, I do have this document. But you know what, <clears throat> right there and then the story changed. The story, the story shifted. It was not so much about, gee whiz, McCormick, are we Irish? It is, holy moly, it's 1909 and I have so many questions. I mean, boom, overnight, what does Catherine do with five kids? What can a woman who's single head of household in 1909 do with five kids? I mean, social norms couldn't vote. Let's think about that. How was she gonna pay for the rent, pay for food, and, and just support her life? Really tough, honest moment. And I thought, wow, this got serious. You know, I was playing and thinking about a trip to Ireland. All of a sudden I'm thinking, this woman, Catherine, who I never heard of, has to deal with all of this. So how does she deal with it? Well, her two older girls, according to the census appear to have some part-time jobs. The son, George, is in high school and her two younger sons, I surmise, this is Ginny uh, assuming that she went to a source of, of calm and peace and went to St. Patrick's Cathedral, the source for so many in, 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 in tough times. And she got some great advice. Well, the Catholic diocese had just opened a brand new orphanage down near New Oxford called the Paradise Protectory. Just about the same time, frankly, that Milton Hershey School had opened in this community. So imagine, imagine that decision as a mother to survive. You offer up your two youngest children to the orphanage. So I have their actual application signed by the, the priest at the cathedral and their admittance forms. They were the 25th and 40th boys admitted to the protectory. It's just stunning. And in fact, I've been on the grounds with my aunt, but I never fully understood how James got there. Now I do. Here's a photograph of a little bit later, probably the 30s, I'm guessing, of, of uh, folks who were living there. Three months after um, the boys arrive at the protectory, Richard passes away and this is his death burial certificate. It's just really a very sad circumstance. So what else is going on there? Catherine remained on Grand Street through 1912 and Ginny suspects once Samuel went on his way to Eastern Penitentiary, Catherine had locked the door from, from having him in her life ever again. From Grand Street, she then moved to Race Street, for those of you who know the city, the Shypok area with Blanche, and the two eldest began their own lives. They were married and moving on. Where Catherine was living is now a park. Again, for context, World War I began in 1914. And then George, who was working down in Steelton, joins her on Race Street for about two years. 
Here she's entering her 50s and she begins to be employed as a nurse, which is pretty terrific when you think about what's coming down the pike here as 1918 is coming upon us. So James spends his full educational years at the Protectorate. He graduates and registers to serve during the third wave of World War I the recruitment in September of 1918. The war ended in November, so he didn't actually serve, but I, actually, I do have his registration cards. And there's something very, I don't wanna use the word intimate, but very specific about seeing a handwriting of someone that you've never met, you know, and you imagine what were they like? Uh, how, did, how did they talk? It's, it's just an amazing experience. So I'm gonna pause here and just say, Okay, we've had an amazing story about Catherine and the kids. Samuel's in jail. But I will say, and I'm not being Pollyanna, but all is not lost in paradise, as in the protectory, which is the orphanage. In most rural orphanages, there is a farm or two or three that makes their living by supporting the orphanage. No exception here, the Wagman family, supported Paradise Protectory. And here's a photograph of the Wagman family, nine kids. Rogan is standing to the far right. I suspect she's about 15 here. And as you can guess it, Rogan and James get married. And I have their marriage certificate, which is kind of cool. Here's an article from the new Oxford item, I will only call out the language used talking about James McCormick of Harrisburg, an orphan. I mean, they actually said these things in the press. Pretty fun, pretty amazing, pretty not fun. So a new generation has turned and there's a little hiccup here. So they're married in 1919, uh, 19, I believe is the year. Um, sorry, I'm, but the census shows James living here in 1920 with his sister Edna and her husband. I've only recently uncovered the reason that Brogan and James were temporarily separated. So I'm going to focus on the central story, which is Harrisburg and the city, and the fact that so many of the places that they live still exist. That's what's so cool about this. The 20 census has Catherine now living uptown as a boarder. Three of her children are married. You'll remember one is deceased, and they're living in Harrisburg. George dies at 25. That's quite sad. In 1923, and he's buried in Mount Calvary Cemetery. And I would say Harrisburg becomes a new paradise. This is the other photo I have of James and Brogan. The little girl in the middle there looking to her left is my oldest aunt, my late aunt Bobby or my aunt Marie. And she's looking at her younger sister Lois, who is my mother. This is the only photo I have of my mom with both her parents taken in probably 1927, and I think it's up at the Capitol building. But you can start to see now the pivot of the family. James has been, James has been, um, I want to get back here a second. James has come from the orphanage and a really tough world. He's married. He's starting to, to uh, make his own state in his own uh, footing in the city of Harrisburg. He owns a business, he has his own truck. He's really feeling accomplished. For many of you who know the city of Harrisburg, this next address will just make you giggle. One of the places they lived is 212 Cumberland Street. And if you say to yourself, 212 Cumberland Street, didn't the late Mayor Reed live there? I would say you are correct. And in fact, it was a Sunday morning that I discreetly took this, this photograph because I did not want him to come out and say, Ginny, what are you doing taking a picture of my house? But now this address means so much more because 
My mom and her older sister and two parents lived here. And it gives new meaning to the phrase, boy, if those walls could talk. But being a small city, it's amazing when you think about the addresses that we share, the stories that we share. Um, it really is one small world. To recap, my mother was one of four girls. Marie, Lois, Catherine, Francis, my mother was Lois. Class, uh, excuse me, born in 1926. The 1930 census notes James, as I mentioned, had a linen service. And my mother and older, uh, my aunt, would often tell stories of my, my grandfather asking Brogan, who was the consummate uh, cook, uh, baker, if, if she would make extra pies so he could take them up to the, to the YW, uh, because he did not easily forget what it was like to grow up in, in tough circumstances. And uh, I, I smile as I tell that story, just thinking about him filling up the, uh, uh, the truck and going up to the Y, pretty neat. I think this is my favorite building in all of the city, 235 North Street. My family, my, my mother uh, and her siblings and parents lived here from 1933 to 1935. And why I am such a fan of 235 North Street is because it's right next door to 231 North Street, which is a great restaurant. In fact, North Street has many great restaurants, Manjaqui, Roxy's, and of course, 231. And you can imagine any poor guest of mine or fellow luncher at 231, anyone who takes lunch with me at 231 has to put up with my story about, you know what, I love the street because I can imagine my mother here as an eight-year-old playing up and down the street in the shadow of St. Patrick's Cathedral. How amazing. I even have an interview audio of my great aunt talking, my aunt Marie talking about uh, how the city parades would turn off of Second Street, go up North Street, then to Third. And my aunt being the vivacious woman that she was, always thought that they did that just for her. It was kind of fun. But I really do have fond uh, affection for uh, the place they lived there at 235. Catherine passed away in 1940 at the age of 76. And if you think about her life's journey, that's pretty amazing in, in, the, in the big picture. The tombstone to the left there is actually George. So she made sure her son had a tombstone. When I actually finally found the plot, thank God my, my wife Remy and I were up in Mount Calvary one Sunday on Mother's Day about three years ago. And she asked me, well, where is the plot? I said, I don't know, I only have a photograph, but we found it. And I realized that at the time, I, I just had to guess. I said, this is, this is George's uh, plot. So I'm gonna guess that, that uh, Catherine, his, his mother is, is uh, buried to his right. So that's where I put the flowers. And then I called the diocese the next day and was able to confirm that indeed she is buried next to her son. So James and Brogan had moved then from North Street to North 2nd Street. 921 North 2nd is probably legend in my family now, and for good reason. Uh, the linen business was going strong. The girls were now some in teenage, some were teenagers, and they were enjoying quite a new life here in the 40s. Until 1943, when history, repeated itself. What do I mean? Well, I mean, unfortunately, James is suddenly ill and he passes away at 43 because as family lore will tell it, and of course his death certificate, his appendix were on the wrong side until they realized where his appendix were located and tried to treat him. It was, uh, it was going to be a fatal experience. So my mother will talk a little, used to talk a little bit about it, but not too much. But I remember things were pretty tight 
because I do remember my mom talking about how the diocese actually donated the plot for James's burial. And he's out on Derry Street. But that then causes Ginny to pause. It's 1943 and history has just repeated itself. My God, Brogan, Brogan is 46. And she's got four girls. So I pause and say, okay, what can a single woman in 1943 who is now head of household do that her mother-in-law could or couldn't do in 1909, of course, in the city of Harrisburg. I am miles away from the McCormick Am I Irish thing, okay? I am like up to my eyeball saying, these are amazing women. This is a crazy story. How could this possibly have happened? But it did. My mother lived it. She would tell the story and it's sobering, absolutely sobering. So again, for context, the Second World War was going to end in 45. What I thought was pretty cool, and you'll see the next slide, I did jump to the Historic, uh, historic Harrisburg Association and, and jump in the uh, directories. In 46, my mom is living in the apartment to the rear of 921 North 2nd, and she's employed. She's got a professional job as a clerk for the mutual life insurance. And I, I call the slide out and I had fun doing it because it is Women's History Month. And I think it's just cool because the truth is my mother spent her, almost her whole life devoted to raising the five kids. She went to theater productions and softball games and basketball games. And there wasn't, she was just, she was that mom. And I'm really proud to be able to say, you know what, in 46, she had choices. And I'm really, really proud of, of who Lois was. And, and the platform that she created for all of us. So Brogan, at that point, I talked about what can a woman do in 43 that her, that her mother-in-law couldn't do? Well, Brogan had four girls. They could clean and cook, so why not have a boarding house? And she did really well. The boarding house at 921 ran for approximately eight years. Lots of referrals. She had a part-time job at the Department of Revenue, but she did quite well. A new boarder, however, arrived. And who was that new boarder? I call it Paradise 2.0. The new tenant was Master Sergeant Robert Roth, right out of the Army Air Corps. He was a native to Wilkes-Barre, had just been released as a POW and newly hired at Western Electric. Well, you can see where this is going. Lois moved out of the apartment, so they say. Robert moved in as a tenant. And the next chapter in my family's journey turns the page. It's really how we arrived at today. Kind of fun. So they get married. There's Lois and Robert, one of their favorite holidays, Christmas, right in front of the mantle. In the late 50s, they moved to Cumberland County. Lois and Carolyn are, are born and raised initially in the city. I'm, I'm born in the late 50s and followed by Amy and Bob. Again, my siblings. And then more recently, Bob and Lois and I, we were, I think we were celebrating uh, Lois's birthday not too long, not too, uh, not too long ago. But you can see the jump start. it's kind of fun. And then another generation arrives. Lois is the only member of our, the five of us that actually had, had a child, Jennifer. For those of you who know Harrisburg City history, she was born in the middle of Agnes, the last ambulance to go across the river from Holy Spirit to Harrisburg Hospital. Lots of family stories about Agnes and Jennifer. So my niece, Jennifer, is the mother of Asia and India. For those of you who I am connected on social media, social platforms, you often see me with photos of my two great nieces and they truly are great. They are city residents and superstars. So wow, all this data on the table, Ginny, and at that time it was 2016 and it gave me time to reflect. Like, what do I have here? 
1909 and places in the city and then 1943 and my mom and dad. And yet here I am and it's 2016 and I'm a woman and what can a woman in 2016 do that maybe her grandmother Brogan couldn't do in 43 that perhaps Brogan's mother-in-law could or couldn't do in 1909. Wow. Well, Ginny can buy a building in the city and move her business inside that property. She can run a business. I can marry my same sex partner. The business can win a small business of the year award from the chamber. And guess what? I can also be the first girl invited to participate in the Rotary Club of Harrisburg and be a member now for over 30 years. So that's 2016. Holy smokes, what a journey from 1900 when the McCormicks landed from Altoona into Harrisburg. But I also know it's about honoring legacy and encouraging another generation. Here we are, my sister Lois, her daughter Jennifer, and Jennifer's daughters, India and Asia, we went back and I made sure that Catherine had her own tombstone installed because we wanted to honor the legacy that in our view lives on. We wouldn't be here had Catherine not made some amazing decisions. So we wanted to honor her and her commitment to family. As I tell the story, unfortunately my family now has heard this at least six times, they know really the story's not done, really, right? There's always a next chapter. And whether we're India who is a sophomore at McDevitt or Asia who's getting grad ready to graduate at Clarion, they know we all stand on Catherine and Brogan and Lois's shoulders, their, their commitment and their persistence to family and to the future. So this was a picture we had uh, last summer, believe it or not, you were able to sneak a dinner in. But it really, the story doesn't end until India and Asia decide what it is that's on their, their, their table. But there is a PS as I wind down to wrap this up. The PS is Catherine's grandfather was Daniel Farron. And I just recently found his obit. He was born in Donegal, Ireland, emigrated in 1850, and he's buried in uh, Cambria County. So this is his obituary dated 1867. So I promised a little bit country, a little bit rock and roll, a little bit architecture, a little bit about ancestry, it was a fun journey for me and I appreciate so much your patience and, and encouragement. Thank you so much for sharing this evening. All right, thank you so much, Jenny, for presenting. We will now go to the question and answer segment. So if you do have any questions, for those of you on Zoom, there is a button in the bottom um, banner that says Q&A and you can type in your text question. For those of you on Facebook watching this live, you can post it as a comment um, to the video feed. So I will give it a minute or two um, to see if any questions come in. Shane? Yes, Dorothy. Hi, this is Dorothy. Jenny, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your presentation. I so enjoyed it. And I like how you looped back to actually discovering that you actually are Irish. So I, I so appreciate your presentation. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Dorothy. Thank you. All right, we do have one question from Facebook. It says, the seven year gap between children did you find anything interesting during her life at that time? Uh, who are we talking about? Uh, 
Let me see if I can get clarity on that. We have another question in the meantime. Okay. How many dead ends and wrong turns did you experience in your research and how did you deal with them and stay motivated? That's a great question because it's almost uh, uh, an encouragement for the world in which we're living in right now. I would say a hundred times there were walls or obstacles or frustrations or dead ends and just as you're about to say, maybe I don't want to spend this two hours on Sunday digging at this, boom, something neat falls on your lap. I can't tell you the number of times I just fell onto something because I was persistent, kept looking, kept researching. And you have to know that I, for me, it was fun. Uh, not everybody finds fun in this. They, they think it's a little bit of a dredge, but... I could always imagine the story behind what was happening at the moment. So that was for me enough motivation. And there's always someone out there, whether it's a member of the association here, or I'll tell you the best person to talk to in your local community is a librarian. They are the smartest people in the room. And if you're stuck on something, they can help you think about your challenge in a new way, a refreshing way. And I think you'll find the fun again in your, in your journey. All right, we have another question that just came in. What was the most interesting topic about early Harrisburg you stumbled across um, that you didn't have time to kind of fully pursue and dive into? Mm. Well, I have a couple of uh, things that I'm perusing. Um, and in fact, you know, one of these days, there's, there's just a lot to be done. I would say um, I want to have a better understanding about what the little mini cities that existed in our city. We've, we've just honored uh, the seventh ward in, in a way. And if you don't know about that, you really need to come up to uh, the association and do some research and read about it. There's a beautiful monument now uh, outside the Irvis building that honors that history of the city. Last month, this program talked about the Underground Railroad, the role this city played in, in terms of our country and state's history is, is pretty amazing. On a personal level, I still have many story threads to pursue and to investigate uh, before, I, before I put my pen down. So I hope that answered your question. All right, thank you. I'm just seeing, we do have time for a few more questions if anyone wants to submit them. And if not, that's fine too. I'm sure when I see you next, there will be a question or a follow through, that's fine. It was really a pleasure to be part of this this evening. Thank, thank you, David, thank you, Dorothy, and thank you to the association. All right, thank you so much. We really appreciate it, Jenny. And um, we look forward to you know getting you back and when we get to meet in person, actually getting to continue this conversation and this discussion. That would be so, fun. Thank you to everyone who joined this. If you have any friends, peers, colleagues, uh, family members who would be interested and didn't get a chance to see this, we will be posting the recording to our website. Generally, it's the next day, but within two days tops. It will get posted to the education program page on our website and our YouTube channel. And someone did just ask, our previous presentations, such as um, last month's on the Underground Railroad, is posted on our website and on our YouTube channel. So if you're unable to find it, just shoot us an email, but it is out there for you to consume. So thank you, everyone, for joining us, and have an amazing evening, and enjoy this warmer weather that's coming to Harrisburg. Thank you.